welcome to another edition of The Property Show. I'm Matt Turner and today I will be speaking to, to interior designers who are based in London. Um, we'll be talking why use an interior designer and what value can they add to your property. Uh, the marketplace today, later in the show, I talk about an area of North London where it's still possible to buy a, a two-bedroom house for £350,000. And that really is a price that a lot of people in central London pay for a parking space. So I'm joined by two lovely ladies today who uh, specialise in interior design. I just tried to uh, pronounce their names and they started laughing at me, so I'll let them introduce themselves. Um, so I'm with... Siobhan Casey. And, and Helen Dabrowski. Fantastic. Who, uh, yeah, both specialise in uh, helping probably busy people... Um, mm, most definitely. Uh, d- ...decorate and uh, design their homes in London. Yes, yeah. And outside. Yeah. And, and outside. Oh, the whole, the whole, uh, the whole package. Yeah. Well... From your accents, I can tell you're not actually from London, and um, obviously London's a very cosmopolitan city, um, so it might be quite interesting to see what brought you to London in the first place. Let's start with you, Siobhan. Uh, so I'm from Botswana originally, and okay. uh, I've lived all over the world, and I'm married to a Kiwi, so I've got a bit of a pavement special accent, uh, and I came to London in 1999. I had a free aeroplane ticket and I thought I would come and suss it all, <laughs> suss it all about. <laughs> and 18 years on, uh, here I am running my own companies and fantastic. it's been fantastic. London's a wonder- wonderful place for opportunity. Brilliant. And, and, uh... um, I'm originally from Paris, um, in France, and um, I came in 1991, I think, a long time ago. Um, originally, it was to complete um, a course that I was doing in advertising and I was doing an internship um, um, in an agency uh, in London and then at the end of that I got a job and I also met my husband and that's why I stayed here <laughs> so if you're listening from overseas at the moment just be careful because as you as you can see you turn up to London and you don't leave which, yes uh, exactly which, which, uh, <laughs> that is so which, true which proves what a fantastic city um, mm. we, we live in so obviously you're both um, successful ladies you've got your own uh, interior design companies yep. correct um, so uh, I suppose probably the question is who uses an interior design company Anybody who is uh, too busy to do it for themselves and who really understands uh, and values the process of creating a fantastic home. So it could be as small as a project as doing a little kid's bedroom to an entire home with multiple bedrooms and bathrooms and they just really want the help to gain the best out of the entire process. Yeah. It's also um, often to try to um, save money and avoid, you know, um, doing expensive mistake by not choosing the r- the right material um, and also um, saving lots of time because um, doing interior design is quite timely. You mm. have to source lots of things and you need to source them quickly sometimes and people don't have the time to do that and it's a minefield out there there's lots of choice to be made mm. and um, we are there to help the client and um, and we also have our own um, trades and builders trades that we use etc absolutely so. yeah, I mean we work with builders and trades all the time so we're we're constantly vetting people in terms of their professionalism and and how well they work and uh, people are only ever as good as their last job with us so yeah. if they behave well and do the job well then we're happy to continue working with them and a lot of our clients come to us because we've got that credibility as well yeah I suppose that's it really I mean there's so, there's so many uh, you know home improvement shops out there and, and people probably think they've got their own uh, uh, taste and it's quite easy I mean I had a phone call from a, a relative actually yesterday saying I was thinking of buying this place man it will only take me two weeks to do it up is it, is it a good deal and I was like two weeks I said well, what, what have you got to do just change a light bulb and, and um, that's incredibly unrealistic yeah. but very typical it's, actually yeah. uh, people really don't genuinely don't realise how long it can take in terms of actually doing it properly there's a design process in terms of understanding how the client wants to live is this an investment property that they're hoping to flip is it their home for the next 15 years are they planning to have children do they have pets yeah. there's a lot of questions that go in right at the beginning and then we sort of go through the process that's of the design a, mm-hmm. yeah and that's a yeah. complete lifestyle uh, I suppose service that you're offering really yes I mean yeah. what's, what is how is the process then so let's let's say you know I've, I've got a uh, an apartment and mm-hmm. I, I put the, 
and give you a call. Um, how, how do we go about? Uh, so typically involved? we um, have a chat with the clients and try and understand about where they want to go. Ask the questions that I've mentioned mm-hmm. previously. So mm-hmm. is, is it their home? Their forever and after home? Is it something that they're? Is it only a temporary environment? Um, we would then go through a, a phased process. We've got concept design where we sort of. Uh, ask them a lot of questions in terms of you know who sleeps on what side of the bed are they light sleepers are they do they sleep through the night um, what type of kitchen do they want what you know who's using the bathroom and really get in a feel and an understanding for how they want to live in the space and then once we once we've got the concept and we've agreed the concept then we move it forward into design development and that's where we're getting down to the nitty-gritty of things so we're looking at actual furniture pieces we're looking at wall colors and carpets uh, and flooring and we're discussing prices of things we're getting yeah. quotations for wardrobes and whatnot and then we've got the implementation so that's all the ordering processes and actually getting the trades on site to so do that. It's not going to take works. two weeks in, is it? Not no. It's a snowball chance of hell. It also <laughs> depends on the client. If they, some client can be maybe a bit indecisive and take time and they need the time to think and that's completely understandable. Absolutely. So it's also very dependent on that. Um, but it's essentially broken in three phases, mm. uh, as Siobhan said. Uh, the concept where you get a direction um, and understand the way they live and then detailed design which takes quite a long time because you have to go through lots of different options Mm -hmm. to get to the right scheme uh, Mm -hmm. which you then implement uh, with ordering everything and putting everything into places yeah so I suppose I mean in many ways if you visit them at their current house you get the the idea of how they're living now Mm -hmm. Um, yes which is always very useful to see how they live in that space and and also meet the members of the family, um, find out what they do, you know, as a profession. This always has an influence if they entertain a lot or not. Lots of things that you need to take um, into consideration. It's fully encompassing service, really, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You wouldn't, yeah. I mean, the, the mm. level of detail of questions that we have to ask sometimes, our clients are always quite surprised in terms of, you know, what type of carpet do you like? Um, has anybody got any allergies? Do we need to think about you know types of fabrics that you don't like? Some some people really don't like silk. Some people really really don't like velvet. You know, so there's lots of things that we we sort of ask a few questions on right at the beginning of the project yeah. to understand the process. Yeah, and I suppose you know it's a bit like my job really. Or um, if I've got a transaction going on, my my girlfriend will say to me, I'm on when I'm on the phone to a client, am I actually selling them a property? Because you know, it's quite an emotional process. Yeah, and absolutely. Yeah, very they'll be on the phone so. to me, and I'm mm. talking. Talk about their relationship or their job yeah. or because yeah. it's affecting it so it's pretty much the same for you, for you. Yeah. Yeah. absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. No, I mean, we get very yeah. close to the the client yeah yeah that's I mean, life yeah yeah and so with both of us we um because helen and i've known each other for quite a few years now we've got really good relationships with our with our clients yeah. and so they tend to be clients that we work with for a number of years we might do a few rooms this year and a few other rooms the next year mm. and then they'll come back to us on future projects in the years down the line because they get to know us and they get to trust us and we end up knowing everything about their kids and the animals yeah. and the pets and cats and rabbits. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. So how, how long have you actually been, um, been, been working? I mean, what actually got you into the interior design? Obviously, we, we found out how you got to it, um, London. How did, how did it all start? For me, it started when I bought um, my own flat okay. and started to renovate it and redecorate it. Um, that's how I got into it. And then I realized that... I was really passionate about that, and that's how that's what I wanted to do. So I start. I decided to change career and retrained. Um, and uh, also going back to my childhood, I remember that uh, I used to do mini sets for my bar- Barbie dolls, and <laughs> I was very involved with decision and about it, it wallpaper. It all started with the Barbie doll. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Wallpaper in my bedroom. Yeah, yeah. If it wasn't the right one, I would get really. Um, annoyed (laughs) so yeah it's something that was always inside me but at the time when I you know studied I didn't realize that's what I wanted to do because it's quite difficult when you're 18 to know which direction you want to go that's pretty you know under growing up it's one of the worst questions what do you want to do when you leave school I haven't got a clue I just want to leave school I totally identify with that though when I when I finished um, high school many years ago I felt like I was in the middle of a triple pursuit board but there were so many different options open to me and I was interested in so many things and how to make a decision and but I like Helene I've always been interested in design and architecture and I remember even as a kid sort of rearranging my mum's furniture in the living room and she'd come home from work and go oh Siobhan what have you done now <laughs> be tripping over side tables and whatnot but um, with, with me I ended up I, when I came to London I ended up getting a job in architecture okay. in, in the admin side of things and I worked in architecture for a number of years and I, I loved it I worked on some amazing projects um, but I, for me personally it was the 
the job satisfaction, the, the architectural projects that I worked on spanned years and so it was quite hard to get a sense of achievement and a sense of job satisfaction and I ended up retraining while I was working full time um, which was exhausting but fun uh, and ended up um, getting a diploma at KLC and uh, which is KLC School of Design here in London and uh, moving sideways into interior design and haven't regretted it ever it, it was an insane amount of work but I love it yeah, yeah. wouldn't do yeah. anything else no, well uh, hey, just to uh, give some um uh, add, add to that, you actually turned up with a bit of uh, bit dust on you today, so you've been working today. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I've, uh, I've, been, I've had a number of meetings before our, our session this afternoon. So yes, I've been on a site in North London, okay. um, climbing up uh, ladders, and I shouldn't be saying this, probably the insurance company might be listening. But <laughs> you, you, had, you had a hard hat on, didn't you? And you yes, really absolutely. Sort of really um, worker it. boots and, and <laughs> checking on first fix wiring and looking at walls and where radiators are going to go and, and talking about you know um, speak, ceiling speakers and flooring types and all sorts of exciting things. So did you have a, sort of a, a certain area of interior design that you, you, you put yourself in? Or, I mean, it's quite a general... Do you specialise in a certain style? or What difference differentiates you guys from... I, well, I, myself, I, I do mainly residential work. Yeah, okay. um, not so much commercial, but... Uh, I don't think I have... Well, I guess I have probably... a specific style but um, when I create home for people it's very much based on uh, what they want in their lifestyle and I try to adapt you know to mm. what they really want but of course through the design there's always something of me in it um, absolutely and color what, what would it be would color. be color yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. what, what's, yeah. uh, what, what's, what's a normal color for Okay. And oh, all, all sorts of colours. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Helen's I mean, fantastic for pulling together colours. I think I'm things. quite. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I love colours, and that's something I really mm. like to work with. I'm not known for doing beige interiors or grey interiors. Well, just basically. just paint it white. I think that was in the state agent. So many people buying places, and you you know you just uh, take yeah. out the granny wallpaper, put, paint it white, and uh, yeah, you know, no. a simple kitchen, and, and put it back on the market. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's not yeah. you. Yeah, no, not at <laughs> that's all. not us. No. Neither of us. So, yeah. I, I doubt that's many interior designers, anyway. So Oh, you, you do get those. Really? Yeah, yeah. No, you do. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think cause with the most interior designers, I think they either uh, can differentiate themselves by developing their own style, and they, they tend to be quite iconic and well known for mm. that. Which is, and, there's, and that's fantastic because it's yeah. it's become almost um, their thing. Um, but I think with most interior designers, we do try to be adaptable for our own clients' own environments and. Um, and figuring out how they like to live and you know whether they like colour whether they don't like colour and I think both of us tend to work uh, trying to figure out how our clients prefer to live mm -hmm. okay and I mean, is it mainly um, so homes that you're doing then or I mean do you, if someone comes to you and you know they've bought a block of flats for example for investment <coughs> you can look at that as well I suppose mm. yes yes yeah, yeah. We, we, we look do, at yeah. all sorts of different yeah. projects yeah we do 80% um, residential 20% commercial so absolutely we've done we've worked on blo apartment blocks and communal spaces communal and, and space, stairs yeah. and receptions and that type of thing and many years ago worked on a hotel which was great fun yeah mm. okay it looks like this one we're in at the moment probably you <laughs> might need to have a chat with the, uh, <laughs> with the area this one looks like it needs a bit of work doing, doing to it um, uh, as well Okay, we'll just take a quick break. You are listening to The Property Show with Matt Turner of Astute Property Search. If you have any property-related questions that you would like to ask Matt, you can email him at matt, with two T's, at astutepropertysearch.co.uk Okay, welcome back. So I'm with uh, Alain and uh, Siobhan. I won't go for the surnames again because you told me off before. Um, so a lot of people listen, obviously, if they've got a house that they're looking to sell uh, at the moment, um, what, what advice would you give them uh, you know, in, in making the place look a little bit uh, more attractive to potential buyers? 
Yeah, so um, I think the first tip that we'd give is uh, is enhancing the curb feel. So it, when anyone is looking for at a home for the first time, uh, the first thing that they see is the outside of the house. So make sure that all your recycling bins and your rubbish bins are super tidy. Plant some plants, you know, that they don't cost a lot of money. Get rid of all the weeds. Um, have a look at your front door. Uh, and see if that actually needs replacing or if it looks good and then internally about I know the sounds everybody says it but decluttering just getting rid of stuff that doesn't yeah. need to be look at the floor clear all the floor surfaces if there's toys around tidy up the toys people can they they really can feel if a space feels smaller than it might be in reality so Which make is everything feel as often open the case actually yeah. if they look at the estate yeah. agent's photograph uh, they've, they've got fantastic cameras uh, estate exactly. agents yes. and you, you think it's a 20 you know <laughs> the width of the room is 20 meters yeah. and when you get there it's, it's about four. three, yeah, or, yeah, exactly. three or four exactly um, i'd say i wouldn't hesitate as well at, um in putting furniture into storage if, if the room is too cluttered you know yeah. just for a month or so uh, just to give an impression of, of space um. and that's not expensive people yeah. think that putting things into storage is expensive it really isn't there are fantastic companies out there who can move it for you for a couple of hundred pounds and it's in storage for eight, maybe 20 pounds or 60 pounds for a couple of months it's totally worth it if, it, if the space feels bigger people can imagine that they can um, envisage their life there yeah. and then accessorize you know some mm. key areas you know just by a few accessories from it doesn't have to be super expensive you know just to make it on trend and uh, exactly. and update uh, the rooms and avoid garish colors you know if you've been living in a home for 10 years and you've got a, a pink door to your teenage daughter's room yeah give it a lick of paint you know that can be quite jarring i've walked into a house before where the chimney breast was fuchsia pink against um, black alcoves, you know, it's stuck out like a sore thumb. And, and sometimes if you're looking to sell the place, that's the things that, that they need to be addressed. And that, that's still on the market now, are you? <laughs> Might be. No comment. <laughs> yeah, it's actually interesting what you said about the bins, because, um, I mean, that's quite a recent uh, recent thing in, in, well, in England, I suppose, having these horrible bins and everyone's got three or four of them outside their house. Mm, different um, councils deal with what, recycling differently, what yeah. What to do with them? But, you know, in many ways, everyone's got one outside, so you're with everyone else but they're, they're well, we've designed things before where it's actually quite tidy and tucked away so you have um, a, a cycling store so actually a bike store next to your recycling bins Okay. Um, and that can be quite tidy and it can be quite lockable and locked away and, and then we've done something quite nice where we put a little roof garden on top of the actual um, felt roof of the cycling storage yeah. and that looks completely minimalist uh, from the street view and tidy and serves a function for the clients as well yeah. so I suppose in many ways it's People judge a book by its cover, so it's yeah. the outside of the house, and then uh, inside, I suppose in many ways, depersonalise as well. Yes, yeah. yeah. You know, if you've got pictures of, Get rid uh, of, pictures. of yeah. the, everybody up there, then people can't imagine them, them, uh, themselves. If they've got artwork, put that up, because yeah. that uh, dress is a place. It's almost like the fabulous scarf on a fantastic black dress. Artwork always really helps sell the place, and it, it gives the impression of a lifestyle. Yeah. Really. So if you, no matter what it is, put the artwork up, but remove the personal photographs. So I mean, is that actually a, a service that you, you know, could offer? I suppose if people literally they're just they're looking to sell their house that's yeah. been on the market, yeah. it's not going. Um, they can get in contact with you and absolutely. you, yeah, you absolutely. come out and give a couple of suggestions. Yeah, we can talk with them for a couple of hours and make yeah. a few key suggestions and help them decide what they need to do. Yeah. We've done that. Yeah. Oh, okay. No, that's, I mean, yeah. Everyone kind of thinks they've got an idea until uh, quite often, again, yes, an emotional thing. It's your own house. Yes, Absolutely. it's quite I'm hard to... I'm leaving this wedding picture yeah. up. I'm leaving this up. Yeah. And, and inevitably, if someone is, has decided to sell their house, there's a reason behind it. And it might yeah. be that they're overwhelmed or their partner's got another job in another city and they need to, or another country and they need to get everything tidied up and, and they don't quite know where to start. And sometimes they just need a helping hand to go, right, this is step one. This is what you need to do. This is step two and so on. And it's good to have uh, the view of an external person, yes. you know, yeah. somebody... Objective. Yeah, that's objective yeah, and there's another house. In many ways, you're yeah. not, not the buyer, but that's exactly what exactly. the potential buyer yeah. Yeah. Um, company is, is going to be. So, uh, I mean, obviously, you, you're based in London. What, what kind of geographical reach do you... Uh, do you have your, um, your all around the UK really yeah many I mean a lot of our work is in London but yeah. we also go outside of London I mean, for example at the moment I've got a job um, in the Cotswold and also in Sussex mm -hmm. and Siobhan 
Yes, I'd say probably 80% of our work is in London, in Greater London, and then we've got projects outside London within about a three hours drive as well. So um, it's not our limitation, but it's, it, in terms of the capacity that we have at any one point, that limits us. Yeah. So, I mean, have, have, must have quite a big team then that you're managing now, have you, or that you're looking after? I mean, um, you're. you're uh... We're a small company. We, uh, we have key staff that we bring on board at, okay. per, on a project by project basis. So, we have project managers as per location and, and as per project. Um, we've got specialists that we work with. And, uh, depending on what the project actually needs. So sometimes if it's just a lick of paint, we don't really need a full building team. We've got, yeah. we've got painters that we can put on site for two to three weeks to get something spruced up. Um, but it is it's it is quite busy. We, it's important to continually grow our database of trades and builders. So this is something that we do on a continual basis. Yeah, mm. I suppose you can never never know too many builders because uh, no. you know, they're, they're always busy. And, yes, uh, and the good ones are. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the yeah. good ones are. Yeah. If a builder's available immediately, there's a reason why. And, um, <laughs> that is probably, I'll give you a bit of a, well, a red warning on that. Very <laughs> cynical. <actually. laughs> um, so, I mean, just, just on, on the funny side, I mean, for me, yeah, when I'm selling places, I, I dress them. But when it's actually my own house, uh, I, I tend to do it up about a week before I'm going to sell it. Um, I mean, you're, the places that you live in, and we don't need to know too much information, but uh, you know, you're probably designing these other houses like fantastically. Are you uh, getting told off by your partners because you haven't done things around your own house? Or? That, yes, is the short answer. Um, <laughs> Helene's place is beautiful. No, I, yeah. I'm, I'm constantly redesigning things. Yeah. So it's like uh, I'm changing things all the time because I'm in the trade. I see, you know, new trends. New trends. Mm -hmm. uh, I go to trade fairs. I will see something. I'm like, ooh, that would look nice in this space. And but you're lucky. Your husband agrees with you. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm quite yeah. Like most couples, He's my just husband. Clever, yeah. right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. My husband and I, we have quite different taste, and okay. so um, it takes a lot of um, discussion, should I say, <laughs> when we need to do something correctly. Uh, and generally, he comes around to my way of thinking but um, I don't really want to force them to do that kind of type of thing and so with you know we, we try and make sure that we have make joint decisions and, but many of our clients the husband and wife don't necessarily agree on yeah, anything it's so quite a they, it, it? yeah it can be sort of um, getting them to understand that there will need to be a compromise and where that compromise needs to be yeah in general there is a common ground yes. you just have to find it and, yes you know yeah we are kind of the mediator oh, in always. between. You have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I mean, what what what? Yeah. You know, what what's in trend at the minute? What's uh, what's you know what's. Oh, I just actually been to Decorex and hundred percent design. Um, metallic is quite very much in trend. Liquid the, liquid metal finishes. Yeah, metal finish. Mm. You know, copper is still there and brass. And bronze is making a yeah, foray, bronze. I think. So um, furniture with bronze. Bl with bling bling, it sounds to me. No, no, not no, at all. no, no. It depends how it's it's done, really. But um, in the industrial industrial look is also yeah very much still around and the jungle the jungle look the jungle there's a lot of that yeah lots of, lots of wallpaper with okay. big pattern lots of bright fabrics as well so color is in yeah. right Absolutely. now <laughs> I, I actually saw it sounds very familiar to a uh, similar to a, a flat i saw in notting hill about two weeks ago it was uh yeah i, I think it was decorated in about 25 years ago it had some let's say granny wallpaper up it was flowery the yeah, kitchen was black uh, had a blue line di diagonal across. I can't think what um, record record it was with the um, the Pink Floyd. Yeah, no? Pink Floyd. Yeah, 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 it was yeah. across the ceiling. Okay. Um, I'm being sarcastic here, but yeah, yeah. actually the, the 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 door when you were, came in was wallpapered, so you couldn't see the front door. Right. Um, so it sounds like that's come back round, and that's yeah. Trend, mm -hmm. It could I think, be um, on trend. <laughs> I do. Well, I do think people are being a lot braver. I think that yeah. they felt mm. really conservative because you had a number of TV programs uh, for years and years saying, you know, white, 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 and more yeah. white, yeah. or beige, beige, gray, beige, gray, more gray. beige, or beige. word, magnolia. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly, yeah. and I think people are realizing that they actually they don't have to do that in their own homes. Be a little bit bolder, have some personality, show their personality, and if they want to have a, a you know a navy blue living room, go for it. Mm. So we're, we're quite on trend with that. But I think Helen's right with the uh, saying that there's a lot of new metal works going on. Metal fabrication here in the UK has been ex very expensive for a number of years. Um, and it's been a little bit of a dying art form and I think a lot more craftsmanship is coming out of the UK at the moment with some fantastic uh, metalwork. 
Okay. Yes, I mean, with, with you know what I said, what, any, you have any weird requests from clients? Any, <laughs> have, you, have you refurbished anything that you thought, oh, really, should I do that? Or? Yes, uh, we do get some strange requests from time to time. So uh, many, many years ago, there was a client who had a very large kitchen and a very large house, and he wanted uh, seven sinks as in seven kitchen sinks in his kitchen okay. uh, because he did not want to walk more than one meter from anywhere where he was standing to be able to wash his hands which um, took my took some time to get my head around um, but we did design it okay yeah. did, he didn't have a dishwasher or something no or? he had no he had two <laughs> he had a restaurant or that, yeah uh, and no, that seven sinks he had two um, dishwashers in this kitchen and this was his personal kitchen there was a commercial kitchen next door so when they had catering, this was a, an extremely large house. Wow. So it sounds like the kind of project you need to get in white and sign off before you even start. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, that was fun. <laughs> okay. I mean, so, you know, with that, what, what are the, you know, the main challenges you, you guys have then with your... Uh, so your within the industry, yeah. um, I suppose there's two, two elements to it. So the one element would be... It's a constant education with clients on uh, on how long things take. So, you know, it's not always possible to get a sofa within two weeks. If they're wanting something bespoke, it can take up to three months to get that mm. made. Um, and understanding the process, is you, if they're buying a bespoke sofa, that there has to be, the, there's the fabric, and the fabric has to be fire treated, and then, then the, you know, that with takes a number of time. Sofas made, so, what, so for example, so if you've got a, a corner that's, you know, regular shape, mm -hmm. you, you kind of know the... Where to get one all you know one one order that oh well well not one order but we would design, design the sofa it. and okay. and then we oh, would wow. we would actually do the product design and then we'd get it made by a furniture maker so that's how we can go into the detail yeah. of that yeah, yeah. Um, and another I suppose another challenge would be um, sexism within the industry to be honest so okay. being female and being on working um, busy building sites and dealing with predominantly males uh, we do come up against that quite a bit in terms of being taken seriously uh, um, from time to time not always I have to say most of the time is pretty good um, but being taken seriously as a female and as a professional we do come across that okay I think for me it would be the challenge is uh, reliability mm. of trades of other trades uh, making sure they turn up on time they do the job properly uh, because you might know a tradesman really yeah. well, but as Shivan said before, he's only as good as his last job, yeah, and yeah, yeah. Uh, you have to keep a check on everything. Uh, and so for me, that's the main challenge. Trust really. is, a, is a big trust. issue. Well, I yeah. suppose it's on yeah. you, and isn't trust. it? If this doesn't get done, yeah, exactly. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. absolutely. Um, I mean, we take yeah. we we with when we're working with a client, they buy into us and our credibility and our database of suppliers that we've spent time vetting and 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 making sure that they do the work properly. And if they've let us down for any reason, um, we need to be able to to solve that really quickly. So we had a project a few years ago where Helen and I were working on it together. And we had an electrician booked to start on site, and he was the first trade in, in, in the many steps of various things happening on this project. And he didn't show up. Yeah. Um, and I had to spend the morning, I think I ended up phoning about 12 different electricians who could start within 24 hours, which is really hard to find um, on a particularly large project. Uh, and luckily we were able to do that because we've got that database behind us. Okay. Well, I mean, obviously it's a challenging industry. I mean, what does it take to be an interior designer? I mean, or how, you know, how can anyone who's listening thinking, you know, I wouldn't mind getting into that industry? What what advice would you? Uh, I think you them? have to be super organised. Yes. It's um, good you didn't say don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> no, do it. Uh, you have to because it's fun. But uh, you have to be super organised, level-headed. And um, Helen's right about yeah. that. It's not all just about being creative. No, yeah. that's ten. I think that's ten twenty percent of it is creativity, and then for the rest of it, you're on site dealing with people. So you have to be also very good um, interacting with client and tradespeople on site. So negotiation skills in terms yeah. of if you need the builder to do something within a certain time frame, it's about managing them. And it's also about managing the clients and about understanding that the people need to be paid on time. Um, and, and yeah, it's, but it is a fantastic job. But it is a lot about logistics and management and admin. You have no idea how much admin, and not to frighten anybody off, but that's, it is a good part of it. And problem solving about something. Oh, problem solving all the time. All constantly, the time. because when you're on site, n never 
a project goes according to plan, there is mm. always something that crops up, you know. Mm. You renovating an old house, you're opening up a wall and suddenly the pipe work doesn't go the way you want or whatever. And you have to come on site and discuss with the plumber, okay, we could do it this way or that way. We do that constantly for all sorts of different, you know, things. Mm. Yeah. I've got a project at the moment where we're having to sort of carefully dig under the foundations for one particular area of the house because we've got up a joint we've got to join up a new gas pipe and a new water mains. Oh, wow. Um but it is it's it's about problem solving, it's about climbing down into the manhole and, and seeing it literally <laughs> I'm not even and sometimes I'm seeing just how much I just <laughs> raised my eyebrows quite high there, didn't I? Yeah. I had to do that, but yeah. Well no, let me let me be clear. I wasn't climbing down into the manhole. I was um, asking the builders very nicely if they would yeah. climb down oh, okay. <laughs> under the under the crawl space under the house and see what was possible. But it, it is pro- about problem solving and seeing what's possible and then explaining to the client, well, we can do this or we can do that, you know. So I mean ideally obviously you start a project, you know, before you know, from from the beginning and take it all the way through but you, do you ever get called in to uh, you know take over projects then or we wouldn't do that yeah. personally i wouldn't do that i um i think we have got a, to be honest we've got enough work on at any one time to be, to be able to yeah. jump into that it's you've got to it's it's the mental exercise and the mental process of trying to get to know the client and understand where they want to go and i think if we were asked and approached to do that particular thing i think we'd find that quite hard mm. What about you? Yeah, it's quite it's quite difficult if you don't take the thing right from the beginning, mm. um, especially if somebody else has been working on yeah. it because they would have put their own stamp, stamp on it mm. uh, and influence. Um, so I mean, it is possible, you mm. know, but it would uh, mean that the project will take longer because you can't just come yeah, up yeah, like yeah. that with new ideas. Yeah, yeah. Got to go back to scratch. And, and it's difficult again, if you've already got the things. builders on site, you know, and that costs money to stall a project and, and restart it later on. It's yeah. got sort of ramification. And it would almost be like jump-starting a car and starting <laughs> cold on a project. I know yeah. that sounds yeah, really bizarre, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. but when... Because we work with a lot of tradesmen that we know, there's an element of trust in working yeah, with the builders. Sure. So we can go on site and if something isn't done quite the way we want, we can have a bit of a joke and talk to the builders and say, look, you know, you need to tweak this or do it properly and get it done the way you want it to get done. If you're jumping into a project mm. cold, there's, you don't have the relationship there and it would, be, it would be that much harder to complete the project. So I'd be wary of that. Yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's one mistake. They didn't call you in the beginning on that one. But what other common mistakes do you think people make? You know, just that you know, um, they should avoid making, maybe. Or you've, um, you've, uh, not planning. Planning is key for any project. Absolutely. So planning, you know, um, the procurement, what you're going to put in the project, you know, thinking of all the dif- different elements from bathroom, kitchen, furniture. You need to plan everything ahead before starting anything. And also um, not having a budget mm-hmm. is another big one because if you start with some kind of ideas but you're not sure, as just as you go along, you'd be very surprised how quickly things can, can escalate. Can escalate. Yeah. Not allowing a contingency. Yeah. So if, if our clients have got a budget, we always sort of say to them, look, you need to, number one, you need to um, address a contingency plan. So if it's a £50,000 budget, take out 10%. Um, and then don't forget VAT as well. VAT needs to be paid on certain things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So really the budget can be a lot smaller than what they might realise. And, and, you know, we're in the year 2017 at the moment and it, things get are getting expensive. Delivery costs through I the suppose, cost of petrol. Yeah, if you're getting them expensive. in from Europe at the moment, they must be even more expensive, mm. right? Because of the, the uh, exchange rate. Uh, yeah. Well, yes. Yes, yes that, is. that has yeah. definitely had an impact. Um, and I won't be shy in saying Brexit has had an impact. We've seen a, a number of suppliers mm. close down because yeah. uh, it's not economically viable to sell to the UK anymore. Yeah. So that's, that's had an impact. I suppose, I mean, in many ways, by using... Uh, people like you, the clients. I, mean, I assume at the beginning of it, you're, you kind of do a cost in for the client to show mm-hmm. roughly what they're going to yeah. uh, be spending. Was you know, I can imagine people who just sort of go go gun ho themselves. I oh, will go and get this, and before yeah. you know it, yeah, that can be you know, a big it's, mistake. It's, yeah. it's quite. A, you, know, you, you see it, 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 especially when people buy a property that needs work rather than uh, one that's finished. They think mm. they're getting a deal, and then the time they've finished it, they've actually spent more than if they bought a property at the beginning. So yeah. I suppose by using you guys... Um, we can help them sort can, of a thing, address things like yeah. lighting plans as well. This is a one of the key mm. areas that I feel quite passionate yeah. about because 
lighting is everything in a home. Like yeah. It's the it's the fixture that you choose. It's the color of the light bulb um, that it, that emanates the, the light. It's where you're actually putting it within the space. So are you lighting the stairs? Are you lighting any artwork? How are you dressing the lighting in the bathroom, in the bedrooms? It's not just a grid of spotlights, which we've seen so often, which happens when clients just get a builder in and the builder doesn't really know anything else and all they'll do is a grid of spotlights and it looks like a runway um, yeah. and inevitably there's you know 36 I've been into a kitchen remember that kitchen uh, Helen and I went to a project some time ago and uh, in the kitchen alone there were 36 spotlights <laughs> and we were just going what <laughs> It's going to heat the room up. Yeah, it? Yeah, oh, well, yes. I mean, it was. Not even essential heating in there, do you? No, clearly not. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, you know, you, 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 I've been to some basement flats where you know the lighting. You, you, it's quite pretty done quite subtly, but you, you're down there, and you know, estate agents always say, "Oh, you've got to come and see. It doesn't feel like the basement." And some of them, yeah, they, they don't. I guess that is down yeah. to mm. sort of good, yeah, good lighting. Yeah, lighting. Yeah, that lighting creates atmosphere. Yeah. Well, no matter where you are, if you're in a fantastic yeah. restaurant or a bar, or if you, even if you're in the cinema. Yeah. It's all about the atmosphere um, that you feel. So a successful lighting scheme will actually feel, make you feel more relaxed than at home within your own home. Um, well, so, so if I've uh, sort of mentioned, get mentioned you together, you've obviously got your own companies. Um, I mean, yes. you want to sort of mention what that is? Uh, so, Len, your company's called? Helen Dabrowski Interiors. And how would one get in contact with you? Um, through my website, uh, helendabrowskiinteriors.co.uk. Okay. And um, Shav- I've gone blank. Up. <laughs> Casey and Fox is my interior design firm, yeah. and I have a support network for interior designers called Metier Rendezvous as well. Okay, and, and well, I mean, on that, uh, I suppose that's probably if people want to get involved in. Yeah, I mean, what, so, uh, Metier Rendezvous is a informal support network for interior designers, yeah. and I've been running that for about seven years, and it really helps interior designers who are primarily one-man bands just get together and and discuss various things that they might be thinking about with in their business so it's a things to do when what happens when the client hasn't paid you what happens when uh, the supplier has gone bankrupt and having uh, the opportunity to have a, an open sharing peer discussion with it with a group of other interior designers um, about the best way to approach certain problems okay so and, and I mean people if they want to get in contact with you for that that's just you know. um, so that is www.metier.com uh, Hyphen rendezvous.com. And that would be people based in anywhere in the world. Our mem- yeah, okay. our, our yeah. members are all over the UK as well, well as in Europe. Okay, yeah. no, that's, that's very good. I, I can't imagine a group of estate agents getting together and sharing <laughs> ideas either. We, we quite often smile at each other in the street and then uh, we're, no. we're stealing each other's deals behind. Uh, <laughs> Do you know, uh, Metier is fantastic. It's actually, it's so, it's a really open, friendly group of, of, of yeah. interior designers. Helene's been a member for a number yeah. of years, so um, I think it's, uh, what yeah. do you say? Yeah, and it's, it's also really good to, um, because in our profession we have to be constantly updated updated on trend and you know on the on the lesser thing and sometimes you have to train in certain area and uh, Metier Rendezvous is also really good for that because Siobhan runs uh, some um, workshops on different subjects just to make sure that you're always you know in the know of the latest uh, things that's yeah. true yeah we've uh, very recently just this past um, week run a workshop on bespoke furniture design so helping interior designers who might not have ever addressed designing a piece of furniture before about actually where to start with that um, how you know are there any sort of ergonomical and typical heights for a, a, a sofa um, and different types of finishes, so metal, metallic finishes, wood finishes, um, and thinking about the actual process from start to finish. Uh, and we also run workshops on uh, business model canvas, which has been quite interesting. So instead of having a typical uh, business plan, which is quite dated, not many people do a business plan anymore, believe it or not. It used to be a document that you'd put in a filing drawer. But actually reviewing their business um, model and figuring out what are the strengths and what are the weaknesses and things that they need to address sooner rather than later. Um, and we've also done a, um, a Trello workshop, which is helping interior designers on the project planning side of things. So things that I, you know, I'm quite good at juggling, which is just, it's just in my nature. So I'm, I am quite an organised person, but I've come to realise that some of the designers might like some help with that. So we've actually helped put together a, a template and a, and a process to help designers go, well, well, this is what you do before you get the phone call from the client. This is what you do once you've got the job. This is what you do as you go through concept phase, design development phase, when you do your invoices and so on. So it's good fun. I enjoy yeah. it. It's yeah. um, 
And you know, many interior designers work by themselves, and this yeah. has created a, a fantastic opportunity for creating friendships amongst them, as well as business relationships. So Helen and I met a number mm. of years ago, and not only are we friends, however many years down the yeah, line, yeah. but we actually work together on various projects um, okay. where we where we um, have things in common. Yeah. Fantastic. So, I mean, if anyone's out there thinking of uh, using an interior design, we can talk about the process. Um, can I ask sort of how, how, how you charge? How, how does one, um, you know, what, what's the cost involved? Uh, how, how has it structured? Um, it's very dependent on the project and the, yeah. and the scope of work. So usually we charge a flat fee for the design phase yeah. of it. Yeah. Um, and we would uh, go and meet the client uh, free of charge for the, the initial meeting and that's how we come to do a scope of work and that's what we base our fee okay, from. So kind of yeah. mm. I think um, every designer charges differently. Sure. There are no hard and fast rules uh, like there are in architecture so um, some interior designers can charge an hourly rate um, and that's really very much suited to where clients know what they want. So if you've got a client who's quite confident within their own style and really has their own furniture and they don't really need a lot of help, they might just need some help choosing doorknobs and cut paint colors and whatnot, yes. that's probably suited to them. Um, we've got other clients where we've charged a, a retainer, so that's probably for very large projects that span a number of years, um, and it might be mainly based towards commercial projects where you're doing a chain of restaurants or hotels, and, and that would be a retainer. Um, but most typically, as Helena said, we would do uh, a flat fee or, or a set fee, um, and that's based on an agreed scope of work where you've agreed with the client exactly what you're doing, uh, and then that moves forward on that basis. Yeah, fantastic. Well, um, it's been really enjoyable uh, hearing what you've been uh, doing and uh, your, your experience is amazing um, it doesn't sound like you get much chance to go home you sound like a very busy lady <laughs> um, miss anything from back home at all I mean London's obviously home mm. now I suppose but, um, um, the food I used to say I'd, I'd miss the food but actually London's fantastic for food mm. so uh, my eyes have been open there I do miss South African chocolate and I miss uh, sunny days with endless blue skies I, I yeah. do miss that yeah okay what about you Helen uh, for me it it was food as well when oh, I came it? 26 years ago but and restaurants but now I mean London has got so many fantastic yeah. restaurants that yeah. I can't complain at all no. um, the only thing I miss is the bakery around the corner and fresh bread so yeah mm, fresh <laughs> and fresh croissant yeah. <laughs> really good ones <laughs> yeah no but, but actually just on the on the croissant just completely nothing to do with property I'm in the um, Pyrenees, they, for some reason, it's called a chocolatine instead of a pan oh, of chocolate. Cho cho oh, yeah. I mean, what, any same thing, really? Same thing. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> they don't seem to think so. If I ask for a pan of chocolate, I get looked at funny. But anyway, we we, um, we we go off track. Um, so yeah, thanks very much, and um, all, all the uh, contact details for uh, Helen and Siobhan will be uh, on the website. And uh, thanks very much. Bye bye. Thanks, Max. Thank you, Max. Thanks. Marketplace with Matt Turner of Astute Property Search, showcasing different areas of London to live or invest in. place today I'm talking uh, about area of North London where I really think there's some great potential for property growth in the next few years now if I was you know when I'm out at networking events and I'm talking to uh, people and they they'll often say to me you know Matt where's where's a good place to be investing at the moment is there any areas that I should be considering in London that uh, offer some good growth now my answer right now would be to look in an area of North London and I've undertaken a few searches here uh, in the last few years um, around Edmonton. Now, the, probably a lot of people might not have heard of this area, or if they have, it's uh, not been for good reason. Um, it's uh, it's got a bad reputation, and you know, if you look on uh, uh, the crime statistics, it's uh, very high on the list of uh, antisocial behaviour offences that are recorded here. And yes, a few months ago, I even tweeted myself that you know I was, I was fed up with people fly tipping in the area, and that's the process where. People leave their fridge, freezer, or you know, washing machine on the corner of the road, and and out of sheer laziness, if you like. And I suppose, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, the local council come and pick this up. So that is an ongoing problem. 
you know, it's it's probably the type of area that uh, you know my mother, if she was driving through, she'd make sure her car doors were locked at the traffic lights. <laughs> but uh, you know, maybe I'm being a bit unjust to the area and painting a darker picture than uh, uh, than it is in reality. And I suppose my mother probably locks her car doors as soon as she gets in wherever she is in the country. She's a little bit nervous like that. But you know, let, let's look at uh, a few other areas that uh, would be comparable to Edmonton um, now. If you'd asked me this question 10, 15 years ago, and I suggested, you know, let's look at Peckham or Hackney, yeah, you probably would think I was just as crazy back then as I am now. But, you know, looking today, if you look at Peckham and Hackney, you know, the, probably the word trendy would go along uh, alongside them. Um, you, you know, your house, let, let's look at a standard property that you'll find anywhere across London. So uh, a two-bedroom mid-terrace house, for example, now that would be uh, around 800 square feet, has a little garden at the back, you know, ground floor, first floor um so you know around 77 square meters if you work in the metric um in peckham that's going to cost you somewhere around 750,000 to 800,000 pounds uh in hackney a little bit more probably 800 to a million now in edmonton and this is probably exactly the same style of house you're only going to have to spend around 350,000 pounds now wow you know it really must be out in the sticks i hear you saying um, you know, on a location-wise, uh, yes, Hackney is a lot more central, um, but you know, Edmonton is um, it's got some great transport links. Uh, there are um, trains every 15 minutes, and it takes you 28 minutes to get into London Liverpool Street. Or if you change to get on the underground, you could be in Oxford Circus in 26 minutes, um, which essentially is the same time as it will take you from uh, uh, from Peckham to get there buzzword these days i guess is gentrification um and you know but what does that actually mean i mean you can look in a dictionary and i guess it will probably uh, say something along the lines of uh you know that the movement of an area to a more of a middle class standard or something but you know, in, in simplistic terms and if you look at high street uh hackney and peckham yes they're going to have you know those artisan uh, bakeries with lovely sourdoughs they're going to have markets at weekends um, and you know the Antipodean uh, coffee shop serving flat whites, which okay, yes, that's one of my favourite drinks. Um, but at the moment, if you look at Edmonton, it doesn't have these shops at all. But you know, like Peckham, like Hackney, they didn't have them either uh, until recently. So you know, you've got to look at the immediate area. Um, so let's look at Edmonton itself, uh, the location here. And I really think because there's going to be a spillover from neighboring areas. Edmonton is surrounded by uh, areas with higher property prices. Um, so, you know, to the, the north and the west, you have uh, very lovely areas such as Enfield, Southgate, Winchmore Hill, highly sought after um, towns within, within London. To the uh, east, um, you have Walthamstow. Again, that, that same house that we were talking about, um, you'd be looking around £575,000 to get on the, on, the, on the ladder for the same house again. And yes, that's just, you know, a couple of miles um, east. To the south, um, now it is quite an interesting uh, uh, part. Tottenham, it's again, it's probably along the lines of Edmonton. It's not really has been a, a, a desired location to, to, to buy in. Um, but because, uh, yeah, you've got the Tottenham Hotspur football uh, stadium there. Now, OK, now that is my team and I'm not suggesting you move there just to be close to a, a football team. But they are spending huge amounts of money building their new 61,000 seater stadium. With this, they've knocked down a lot of buildings in the area and they're piling money in. Um, they're, they're building, I think it's 579 uh, high rise um, new apartments. Um, the stadium itself is going to be finished um, next year and then the apartments uh, will be constructed thereafter and no doubt um, these will be sold off plan um, you know, in, in the years to come. And once the stadium's finished, uh, you know, there's going to be a lot more service sector jobs, employment probably will be, uh, be helped um, around that immediate area. And I actually read also that a uh, national um, a house builder as, um, as it had de designated twenty million pounds just to buy land um, that was, that was you know, with the intention to then build uh, property on. Um, so you know you can see there is money definitely coming into that location. 
again, if you want to look at the coffee shop uh, bakery analogy, another good sign is to see that estate agents are moving into the area. And this is the case around Tottenham. They can see that transactions are going to be uh, going to be happening once the stadium's finished. You know, the area is going to have a much uh, pleasant, more, more pleasant look, if you like, um, and transactions will be happening. And it could well be a reflection of other areas in London having uh, fewer transactions, I, I suppose. Um, but you know, that, again, that is um, a good sign. Transport links in the area are very good. Um, you know, we've talked about the trains. But uh, yeah, okay, and roads anywhere, if you're driving in rush hour, you're not really moving that quickly. But Edmonton is, is served by, you've got the North Circular, that leads out to the M11, which goes up to Stansted. You have the A10 dual carriageway, which goes out to the uh, M25, which is the uh, motorway that runs um, around, around uh, London itself. So you can get out and about very, very easily. So I suppose one of the key words really is investment. And I've mentioned before, you know, the difference between a head purchase and a heart purchase. Now, yes, yeah, a heart purchase, obviously, that's property that you're going to move into. You fell in love with it and you know, you just had to buy it. But, you know, let's just look from a sheer investment point of view. So that house at £350,000, you know, your rental yield is going to be, you know, you're probably looking to get around thirteen to £1,400 a calendar month. And that will give you around 4 4.5% uh, gross yield per annum. Now, uh, in London, that's fantastic. You know, it's, it's really unheard of. And if you go back to show two, I spoke to mortgage broker Liam Johnson. He actually said that the number of buy-to-let applications he was dealing with had reduced dramatically in London. And that's essentially because the, the criteria that the mortgage companies um, had put out there, landlords were not able uh, able to get uh, enough rent to cover the, the amount that the mortgage companies wanted, you know, and, and rental yields again, yeah, in London across uh, it's probably somewhere around two two percent. You'd be doing very well um, on on a two percent yield. People look, you know, farther afield for big yields in 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 the UK. You know, you'll often hear people saying, "Oh, I've bought a place in Sheffield, for example, and I'm getting an eight percent yield." Well, you know, that's fantastic, but in in many ways, your I, I always believe, you know, in a downturn your capital is less protected, obviously, in those areas. London, you know, in a property terms, would be the blue chip um, investment within the, the the UK. Another point to think of, this is a house you know, that you're buying. Um, it's going to be freehold. Now, I deal with international guys, and yes, and even people from the UK have a very, you know, the, the leasehold freehold system that we run here, you know, is, is very archaic, and it's, it's a little bit complicated. But essentially... If you're buying a freehold property, you own the land, that's the freehold, and then the property on it. Now, in Edmonton, because it's still one unit, one house, that will be the case. Now, you know, if you look at Fulham, for example, which, again, is going to have very similar houses to the ones we've mentioned, um, the freehold is the land, and then at some point, the freeholder decided to sell the ground floor as a flat and the first floor as a flat, and he sold those two units on a lease. So then you have a freehold, leasehold situation. In Edmonton, these properties have not been carved up as yet. So you can imagine there's a lot of flexibility. Um, I'm not suggesting that you buy them and split them into flats, but there is the potential to you know, make extensions at the back or go into the loft to make that two bedroom into a three or potentially a four bedroom property. And because it is freehold, there's a lot more flexibility. You don't need uh, so much permission, you don't need freeholders consent because essentially you are the freeholder. Yes, you've got to speak to the local planning office for larger um, e extensions um, and go down the ne necessary channels. But yeah, the flexibility that a freehold property offers is uh, is fantastic. Now in London at the moment, obviously Crossrail is is uh, quite a big thing. People are looking to buy uh, around stations that uh, Crossrail. Um, our uh, Crossrail stations are located now. Crossrail One, which is the one that's uh, is sort of opening in 2018, is running from east to west uh, London. I think it's sort of Abbey Woods and there's uh, Shenfield um, across to Heathrow Airport, and it's reduced the time that that will take. And there's you know some designated uh, uh, stations, and people are looking to buy around those stations. Now, okay, it's a little bit further farther afield. But Crossrail 2, uh, it's in consultation stage at the moment, that's going to be running from North London around Hertfordshire, passing through Edmonton, 
Um, they're not sure exactly where the stations are going to be, but there's one in Ponders End, which is Edmonton, um, and Angel, Northumberland uh, Park. These are all around Ed Edmonton area. So Crosswalk 2 is going from Hertfordshire down to Surrey. So it's crossing North uh, London to South London, and it's going to be reducing times. Again, this is a little bit, you know, it's a few years away, um, you know, but when's when's a good time to get on board? Is it once, you know, the, uh, the stations are there and then people will pile in? Or is it now, you know, before uh, the, the word is out, if, if you like, um, and, you know, the, the, the uh, initial growth is gone? You know, that is the time right now. Now, to round off this show, I will sort of mention my uh, my first boss in property. He's, he was always on at me to get on the property ladder. Matt, you've got to be buying a property. Well, when it came to the stage where I could potentially afford one, he said to me, Matt, what do you got to do? You've got to drive around, look for areas where, in quite simplistic terms, you know, again, it's like the co looking for the coffee shops or going to the train station. He said to me, drive up and down. If you see, you know, a lot of skips down roads, if you see scaffolding outside properties, you know, basically building sites. It's the sign of a healthy market. People are buying, people are selling, transactions are occurring. You know, if you see a lot of sold boards uh, down, you know, from estate agents, things are happening. And if you come around Edmonton right now, you'll just see this, I think that, you know, the starting signs of this, you, I'm, you're just seeing people doing loft conversions, you know, and that's very easy to look out for. You'll see the v Velux windows, you know, even can see the extension at the back of the house. So, I really believe that the you know the early routes. If you've got this kind of budget level, you know there's uh, within London especially, you know it's less risk. You'll you'll uh, get a good yield on your property. And if you're doing the buy to let, you're probably you know with forty percent down, you're laying out around one hundred sixty thousand pounds after fees to buy that three hundred fifty thousand pound property. And again, get in a four percent, they're about to yield. So. Hopefully, you know, you've learned a little bit about Edmonton. Um, and uh, if you need any further information, do get in contact with me. All my uh, contact details are on the, the, the website. Thanks for tuning in today. I really hope you've enjoyed today's topic. Um, talking about future shows, if there's anything that you would uh, love me to discuss in the world of property, uh, do feel free to email me or you can always find me on Twitter. All my uh, contact details are available on the UK Health uh, website. Uh, next week, we've got a very exciting show. Um, I'll be interviewing an auctioneer, talking about uh, you know when do people decide to buy or sell at auction. And the property market takes me to uh, Hampstead, which uh, you know, if you've ever been to Hampstead, it's a beautiful village, and you kind of forget you're actually in London. So I look forward to seeing you next week. That's Matt Turner on the UK Health Radio.